Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. The great American physicist and Nobel laureate Richard Feynman said, It doesn't matter how beautiful your theory is. It doesn't matter how smart you are. If it doesn't agree with the experiment, it's wrong. We're going to do an experiment today to test out the accuracy of official government temperature graphs. First, we're going to look at a graph from 45 years ago. This graph was released by the National Center for Atmospheric Research in 1974. It showed a lot of warming from 1880 to about 1940, and then very sharp cooling. The 1974 NCAR graph showed no net warming from 1870 to 1970. This is obviously a very different story from what we hear from climate scientists today. In 1975, the National Academy of Sciences published another graph which was very similar to the 1974 NCAR graph. It showed lots of warming prior to 1940, and essentially all of that warming was lost between 1940 and 1970. The New York Times reported in 1961 that there was unanimous consensus among scientists that Earth was cooling. There was no general agreement about the future, but there was widespread agreement about what had been occurring since the 1940s. Now let's look at the current NASA global temperature graph, which shows fairly steady warming from 1910 until the present. It shows a tiny bit of cooling after 1940, but nothing like the large cooling seen in the NCAR and National Academy of Sciences graphs. Zeekow's father from Berkeley Earth insists that the 1974 and 1975 graphs were incorrect and that the current graph from NASA is correct. And he explains the difference as being due to a large number of stations which have been added since 1975. This 1974 NCAR graph was created with several hundred very high quality stations with a long term temperature record. By contrast, the vast majority of stations used in the current NASA graph are very low quality. They made a trade-off between a relatively small number of high quality stations and a very large number of low quality stations. Now we're going to do a simple experiment to determine if the 1974 and 1975 graphs were more accurate or if the current NASA graph is more accurate. First I'm going to read some relevant quotes from Richard Feynman. It's amazing how many people even today use a computer to do something you can do with a pencil and paper in less time. He also said, have no respect whatsoever for authority. Forget who said it, and instead look what he starts with, where he ends up, and ask yourself, is it reasonable? And the most important one, the test of all knowledge is experiment. Experiment is the sole judge of scientific truth. Our very simple experiment is going to be to compare historical records to the different temperature graphs and see which one aligns more closely. Let's proceed now to the experiment. In 1902 it was reported that alpine glaciers were disappearing. The famous glaciers of the Rhone have shrunk several thousand feet in the last 20 years. In 1903 it was reported that glaciers all over the world, including Greenland, were receding. In the November 1922 edition of the Monthly Weather Review, it was reported, the Arctic seems to be warming up. Reports from fishermen, seal hunters, and explorers who sail the seas about Spitsbergen and the Eastern Arctic all point to a radical change in climatic conditions and hitherto unheard of high temperatures in that part of the Earth's surface. Many old landmarks are so changed as to be unrecognizable. Where formerly great masses of ice were found, there are now often moraines, accumulations of earth and stones. At many points where glaciers formerly extended far into the sea, they have entirely disappeared. Formerly, the waters about Spitsbergen held an even summer temperature of about 3 degrees Celsius. This year recorded temperatures up to 15 degrees. And last winter, the ocean did not freeze over even on the north coast of Spitsbergen. That description is very different from this year. This year, a boat full of global warming tourists got stuck in the ice around Spitsbergen. In 1923, it was reported that Glacier National Park in Montana was rapidly melting, and it was predicted by scientists that the Spray Glacier would disappear within 25 years, or by 1948. Well, it's been almost a century now, and the Spray Glacier is still there, and it's quite likely that it's actually grown over the last two very cold years in Montana. 
Eighty years ago, it was reported that all of the glaciers in eastern Greenland were rapidly melting. It may without exaggeration be said that the glaciers in Greenland, like those in Norway, face the possibility of a catastrophic collapse. It was also reported in 1939 that the eastern Arctic was warming extremely fast. Scientists have confirmed the fact that the Arctic regions around Spitsbergen are warming up at the rate of approximately one degree in every two years. Since 1910, when observations first started in those regions, the cumulative rise of winter temperature has amounted to nearly 16 degrees. In 1940, it was reported that the ice of the Arctic Ocean is melting so rapidly that more than one-third of it has disappeared in 50 years. In 1947, it was reported by a leading scientist, if the Antarctic ice regions and the major Greenland ice caps should reduce at the same rate as they are at present melting, oceanic surfaces would rise to catastrophic proportions and people living in the lowlands along the shores would be inundated. Dr. Allman added that the temperatures in the Arctic have increased 10 degrees Fahrenheit since 1900, an enormous rise from the scientific standpoint. In 1952, it was reported that the polar ice caps were melting at an astonishing and unexplained rate and threatened to swamp seaports by raising ocean levels. The glaciers of Norway and Alaska, he said, are only half the size they were 50 years ago. The temperature on Spitsbergen is so modified that the sailing time has lengthened from three to eight months of the year. This was reported by Dr. William Carlson, who was president of several universities, including the University of Vermont. He was also a geologist and meteorologist who spent several years working in Greenland. In 1954, Canada had to move their largest Arctic settlement because the permafrost underneath it was melting. It was reported that the average temperature of the inhabited parts of the Earth had risen about 2 degrees Fahrenheit within the past 100 years. In Spitsbergen, the average winter temperature has risen 19 degrees since 1910, and the harbor is now open 200 days a year. Where records have been kept, the facts are beyond question. In Philadelphia, United States of America, the rise in temperature has been 4 degrees in the past century. In Montreal, in Britain, and in Scandinavia, the increase has been about 2 degrees since 1850. In 1955, it was reported that melting Arctic ice was warming up the world. There are now 6 million square miles of ice in the Arctic. There was once 12 million square miles, so 50% of the ice had been lost by 1955. In 1958, the New York Times reported that the polar ice pack was 40% thinner and 12% less in area than it was a half century ago and that even within the lifetime of our children, the Arctic Ocean may open, enabling ships to sail over the North Pole. The November 1976 issue of National Geographic detailed the very rapid disappearance of glaciers in the Alps during the first half of the 20th century. This picture was 1901, 1925, 1940, and 1956. The text which goes with this is very important. Glacial retreat high in the Austrian Alps marks the abnormal warmth that prevailed in the first half of the century. Remember that phrase, abnormal warmth in the first half of the 20th century. But things changed quickly. By the year 1961, it was obvious to everyone that Earth was cooling. By 1963, glaciers were growing in Norway for the first time in 200 years. By 1970, the United States and the Soviet Union were mounting large-scale investigations to determine why the Arctic climate was becoming more frigid, why parts of the Arctic sea ice had recently become ominously thicker, and whether the extent of that ice cover contributes to the onset of ice ages. In 1973, it was reported, the Earth is cooling, return of ice age is feared. Snowbanks cover areas of Baffin Island today, which were seasonally snow-free 30 or 40 years before the present cooling, J.T. Andrews and his colleagues at the University of Colorado at Boulder report. Similarly, pack ice around Iceland is once again becoming the serious hindrance to navigation it was during the Little Ice Age of the 17th and 18th centuries. C. Bertrand Schultz of the University of Nebraska State Museum at Lincoln finds that warmth-loving animals, such as the armadillos, which expanded northward into the American Midwest in the first half of the century, are now retreating southward again. And the Czech Academy of Sciences reported that warmth-loving snails in Europe had retreated. 
England's annual growing season shrank by 9 or 10 days between 1950 and 1966. In the northern tier of the U.S. Midwest, summer frosts once again occasionally damage crops. Sea ice has returned to Iceland's coast after more than 40 years of virtual absence. During the last 20 to 30 years, world temperature has fallen irregularly at first but more sharply over the last decade. U.S. National Science Board, 1974. Glaciers in Alaska and Scandinavia have slowed their recession. Some in Switzerland have begun advancing again. This was also from the November 1976 issue of National Geographic. See, Cow's father from Berkeley Earth wasn't even alive back then, but he believes that he knows more about the weather in the 1970s than all of these scientists who were studying it at the time. So we've collected our data, now let's do the experiment. This graph overlays the information we've collected over the last few minutes on the 1974 NCAR graph. In 1902, glaciers were disappearing. In 1922, glaciers were disappearing. In 1939, Greenland glaciers were nearing collapse. And then in 1963, Norwegian glaciers were growing, and Iceland was blocked with ice by 1973. So in the 1974 NCAR graph, ice melts when temperatures are warm, and ice forms when temperatures are cold. That makes pretty good sense. Now let's do the same experiment with the current NASA temperature graph. In 1902, glaciers were disappearing. In 1922, glaciers were disappearing. In 1939, Greenland glaciers were nearing collapse. In 1963, Norwegian glaciers were going and in 1973, Iceland was blocked with ice. Obviously, the NASA graph makes no sense. It has ice melting when it's cold, and it has ice forming when it's warm. This graph has failed our experiment. And remember the quote from the November 1976 National Geographic article talking about the abnormal warmth of the first half of the 20th century. The NASA graph no longer shows that. In fact, they show abnormal cold during the first half of the 20th century. The NASA graph does not match the written historical record. The 1970s global cooling was very real. Had Zeke Hausfather been alive then, he would have been aware of that fact. I'm going to be covering this topic in more detail in future videos, but I'm going to end this one with a few relevant quotes. There are lies, damn lies, and statistics. Mark Twain. It will be remembered as the greatest mass delusion in the history of the world that CO2, the life of plants, was considered for a time to be a deadly poison. Richard Lindzen, Professor Emeritus, Earth Sciences, MIT. It's very clear which graph was correct. The 1974 NCAR graph makes sense, but the current NASA temperature graph makes absolutely no sense at all. Sorry, Zeke, you can't rewrite history by throwing in huge amounts of low-quality data. In this 2009 ClimateGate email, we can see exactly what happened. Climate scientists colluded to make the 1940s warmth and subsequent cooling disappear. I show this email all the time because it's extremely important for people to understand the temperature record. Tom Wigley at NCAR, to Phil Jones at the University of East Anglia, and Ben Santer of Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. If we could reduce the ocean blip by, say, 0.15 degrees Celsius, then this would be significant for the global mean, but we still have to explain the land blip. It would be good to remove at least part of the 1940s blip, but we're still left with why the blip. Climate scientists colluded to corrupt the temperature graph, and they succeeded. The current NASA temperature graph makes absolutely no sense. I'm going to leave you with one more Feynman quote. Reality must take precedence over public relations, for nature cannot be fooled. The broken NASA temperature graph is the cornerstone of the EPA's CO2 endangerment finding. And the CO2 endangerment finding is the legal basis climate alarmists are using to shut down the U.S. energy supply. It's very important for people to understand that the NASA temperature graph is based on propaganda, not science. We need to get the message out to our lawmakers and get the CO2 endangerment finding revisited and shut down. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.